Well, welcome back to the podcast for Cultural Reformation. I'm Nate Wright and uh, joined by Dr. Joe Boot. As always, it's good to have you and uh, good to be back, Joe. Great to be here, Nate. So this is the uh, Ezra Institute's podcast for Cultural Reformation. The Ezra Institute uh, trains and equips current and emerging cultural leaders in Christian apologetics, worldview thinking, and Christian philosophy. We have lots of training programs that I would encourage people to check out, and uh, lots coming up uh, both in the UK, in Canada, also in the US. And so uh, go to our website at EzraInstitute.com. We're coming out of the Easter season, uh, Easter weekend, uh, and uh, Joe got to celebrate across the pond from me, but we both were just reminiscing about uh, wonderful Easter weekends that we both had. So uh, we thought we'd take this, uh, this podcast as an opportunity to just talk about the resurrection, talk about the crucifixion, talk about all that Easter means for us, the implications of the resurrection for the Christian life, for culture, for apologetics. Uh, so that's sort of what we're doing today. But why don't we start, Joe, um, because one of the things uh, that we talked about, one of the reasons uh, this topic was on your mind is because last week leading into Easter, you had some opportunity to do some ministry in Aylesbury and talk about the resurrection. So why don't you talk a little bit about what you did in Ail- Aylesbury and uh, some of the conversations that you were able to have leading into Easter? Yeah, thanks, Nate. It was an interesting uh, opportunity, actually. Uh an unusual one in some respects because it's not often that you get to speak to over 1300 high school students uh in in a single day in state schools like in government schools and um and uh that that was the uh, that was the opportunity um recently for me and uh It's interesting for another reason, too, which is the the degree of biblical illiteracy now in the younger generation is such that very often when you go into these environments, I mean, the the group um, that were hosting me called Youth for Christ, uh, which is a sort of an outreach evangelistic organization in the UK, um, had found that this particular part of the country, this particular town, was one of the most unevangelized towns in uh, the entire country. Uh, in fact, um, I think it was well into the the ninety five percent ish of young people in the in the town had never even heard the gospel. So you've got wow. uh, this sort of incredible opportunity to introduce um, introduce people to it. So I did some I did some speaking to uh, high schoolers in the government schools. I did a debate on the resurrection. Uh, I and uh, I also spoke to a Socratic society of students doing their um th- their exams just before heading off to university uh and then the the day finished with me doing a, a sort of special outreach event in in a, in a church in the town and that's going to be on premier christian radio uh, it was an interview sort of setting and style for that for that event um and yeah it's built around the whole the whole easter theme and as you say you know we've just come out of the, that that probably the well more than probably i think certainly easter is even beyond christmas the most important uh date in the christian calendar and you know you've got good friday uh the 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 quiet day of of saturday of 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 waiting easter sunday and then oftentimes of course you know these are bookended for many people by by holidays um yeah. and there's there's a lot of time to to reflect And so we thought for today, why not? Let's talk a bit about the significance of the resurrection and um, its importance. One of the first things I said to the students was uh, that the these the calendar that you know the Christian calendar that to 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 a large extent still is is what we follow in the West. I mean, I know there's been all kinds of efforts to kind of. Uh, water it down to try and throw in. I mean, there's been lots of celebrations of, you know, controversy in London in the UK recently because, you know, lights for Ramadan were up, but there was nothing about Easter in certain areas and councils were suddenly scrambling, as this was pointed out, to put up some kind of Easter, um, you know, uh, stand or whatever it is, just so that, uh, uh, you know, they're looking like they're being even handed. But the reality is we're following a Christian calendar. It's AD, it's BC. Some of these basics you have to remind people of today that that the the Christian calendar punctuates our year with meaning, and that's what calendars do. Birthdays, 
uh, we punctuate the year each year with birthdays in our family. So we've got there's a, there's a cycle in all of our years to a degree, especially if we've got children and extended family. There's those kinds of uh, calendar of events. The state, of course, modern governments in the West, they have invented all kinds of additional days um, to try and inject a kind of humanistic and secular meaning as well. So you've got your, you know, um, your Valentine's Day. Not that they're all bad, eh? not being a killjoy. Um, you know, Valentine's Day and Family Day, as though people need reminding, you know, to focus on your family periodically. Um, the But the state, you know, it thinks that it has to, tell people what to do in these things uh, in this day and age um and then you've got your um uh special you know canada dominion day or you've got your uh in in the united states independence day um there's victoria day there are these various days and then of course we've got the really sort of progressive um secular cultic religious celebrations of pride and all of that which um are, are an attempt to turn the calendar from a Christian calendar into a pagan cultic calendar. Um, so calendar dates punctuate our year with significance and they, uh, they create meaning in the cycle of our lives. Um, and uh, so our year follows a given rhythm and that rhythm is filled with meaning by the dates that we celebrate and remember. And, I love Christmas and I absolutely love Easter um, as a believer, not only because it usually affords me great evangelistic opportunities like the one I've just had, um, but because it gives you those those times of of space for a depth of reflection again on the work of Christ and its significance, the significance of his kingdom work in history. And it was a real blessing to be able to talk about that and 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 remind students about the, the the significance of the calendar and how Christ himself shattered their history into two halves, into BC, before Christ, and AD, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, that every time you write the date, you are remembering you are you are essentially stating the life death resurrection of jesus christ the year of our lord 2024 and it's amazing how few uh young people in particular but i i think in our uh kind of post-christian uh culture uh, it's amazing to me how few people actually know those kinds of small details. They were they were assumed in a previous generation, um, and uh, they just haven't been taught. And I think a lot of it has to do with public schools, and um, you know, uh, uh, oftentimes what what uh, what one culture takes for granted, you know, the next generation they don't learn anything. So um, it's amazing how few people know that. And I, I guess so. You and I have noticed as people who have been engaged in gospel ministry and evangelism and apologetics for a number of years, um, we've noticed that a lot of the um, apologetics surrounding the resurrection have changed. Um, but before we get to that, let's just kind of talk about some of the traditional, right? It used to be that an, a Christian apologist around Easter would get up and the questions would be surrounding, well, you know, what didn't didn't the disciples just steal the body of Jesus and and these kinds of just apologetic answers to how certain can we be historically that the tomb was empty and that Jesus rose from the dead and there are good apologetic you know uh, answers to some of those questions so why don't we start with sort of traditional apologetics concerning the re resurrection um, and talk about the the good reason we have to believe that uh, that history is split by a true historical event. And I think that'll also help some of our Christian listeners, because I think one of the things I, I reminded my church this past weekend was sometimes we can we can get so enamored with the theological ramifications of Easter weekend. And that's a good thing. Theology matters. You know, what we believe matters and how we understand these deep theological truths. And we can get so caught up in the concepts and theology, though, sometimes that we forget that we're celebrating a true historic fact. And we took a few moments at the beginning of, of our uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday services just to talk about, you know, to, uh, about 2,000 years ago in history, on a day like today, you know, God in the flesh was nailed to a, a tree outside of Jerusalem and, and you know, uh, walked out of a grave. 
and and I think sometimes we miss some of that stuff. So let's talk just some about uh, about some of the mm. um, kind of traditional apologetics concerning mm. the uh, the empty tomb and the resurrection of Christ. Well, some of the historical touch points as we sort of uh, wander into that are, uh, as you say, significant because in a in some respects life has become increasingly sort of a historical, right? With the with, with this sort of cultural amnesia and with the instant sort of um, character of our culture now and very often a lack of historical awareness, uh, people live disconnected from the past uh, for the most part. And as you said, Nate, that, that, that is an indictment on our education system for the most part. Um, but there is a real disconnect. And um, one of the things I, I I talked about was the fact that um, the one of the charges that, is, that, that, that are raised against Christianity in general before you can even open your mouth about the resurrection is that it's seen as a Western religion and, you know, it's, uh, it's a colonial Western religion, therefore we're not going to listen. Um, and so one of the things I did in terms of this historical touch point was, was, was to explain to the students that Christianity came to Britain, first of all, probably in the fourth century, around the fourth century with the Romans. And uh, uh, when it arrived, our ancestors were still drinking the blood of the dead. I mean, they were pagans sacrificing their children uh, to, to, to pagan deities. And in about 550, 597, thereabouts, uh, Augustine of Canterbury, brought about 40 missionaries uh, who would have been monks to Britain to begin to evangelize in a, an, an extensive way these pagans. And uh, I, I, I talked about the fact that, you know, it had, the gospel had been in China and India and North Africa uh, long before it reached us um in britain and of course that's our in canada we've got a shared history the history of 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 britain um is the is the shared history of of canada in many respects um and so uh five night five five ninety seven anselm arrives and he starts talking about the gospel about the resurrection of christ about the death of christ about its significance and its meaning and gradually the gospel begins to spread and uh, and then, of course, Alfred the Great and his um, missionary activities amongst the various invaders, especially the the Vikings, uh, what we know is that we call the Vikings today, um, and uh, the gradual transformation of England. And I said to them, this is why when you look around this town and every town and village across this land, you see these spires uh, in every village and in every town, because these uh, places of worship, the church, were the center of meaning for those communities. That's why they're the most expensive be buildings, the most prominent buildings, because they are pointing us to the center of meaning, which is Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection. And that is what filled our lives with meaning and that's reflected then in these buildings then i talked about the coronation the recent coronation of king charles the third our head of state in canada and the and uh, in the united kingdom and why he swore an oath to uphold the gospel uh, why he gave you know his easter message um uh, and and referred to the lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the kind of ignorance around these historical things means that when you approach these more traditional apologetic questions, um, I would say the interest in them from the average young person is minimal because they, in many respects, lack the biblical liter literacy uh, to even know what kinds of questions to ask and certainly raising some of the more um, enlightenment-based objections uh, to the resurrection are not, you know, on the tip of the younger people's tongues today. Um, but in terms of those core, those key moments in traditional apologetics, which, as you say, still have their place, and, and I, I talked about some of them. I did a debate on the resurrection. Um, and there are, there are essentially five... Uh, 
let, let's call them um, original witnesses. There are five um, ancient sources, ancient documents that uh, are reliable or agreed to be reliable ancient documents that testify to, I would say, four central facts. So we've got five key witnesses. We've got the four Gospels, obviously, um, and there's Luke Acts there. And then, of course, you have the Apostle Paul. Um, and, um, of course, a lot of New Testament scholars, New Testament critics um, will will say that um, Matthew and John have completely independent uh, source material. Um, the oldest of the Gospels is the Gospel of Mark. There's almost unanimous agreement around that. But within the first 40 years um, uh, after Jesus' uh, resurrection, these these documents are circulating. And then, of course, you've got the conversion of the Apostle Paul around AD 33, um, and his letters, and of course, most famously, that crucial statement, 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, you know, I received um, that which I have passed on to you. Um, and uh, he goes through, I think I have it here somewhere, um, for I passed on to you as most important what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried uh, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apost all the apostles. Last of all, as to one abnormally born, he also appeared to me. Um, most scholars agree that the um, when he says that uh, um, I received... I passed on to you what I also received. He's referring there to his two weeks with James and Peter uh, after you know his um, Damascus experience and time in the desert. Uh, his time with 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 Peter and and James. That this this was a this was the received tradition that's very very ancient, going back to probably five six years from the resurrection itself. And then of course Paul tells us there's living witnesses. Um, and the gospel is being preached in the very place where Christ was was crucified. So we've got these we, these five ancient sources um, that are deemed to be reliable, and 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 there are four facts that all of these sources agree on: uh, the death and the burial of Jesus, uh, which uh, and the burial, of course, being in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That's significant in part because. Um, Joseph is a Jew. He's a secret follower of Christ, but he's a member of the Sanhedrin, and he's a he's um, a significant leader of the Jews. That's a very interesting fact to include. Um, uh, you know, here is somebody who's a, a member of those uh, of, of a body that's opposing the disciples, and again, the the a prominent person. The the location of the tomb is known because the Sanhedrin has guards stationed at the tomb, and uh, he's he's buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So that's the first fact. The second fact is the empty tomb of Jesus. So Mary Magdalene, uh, the other women, discover uh, the the empty tomb, and this is on the third day. So again as the Jews count, it touches on the Friday, the Saturday, the Sunday. That's why it's the third day, even though it's not three periods of 24 hours. Um, and again, interesting uh, fact, because according to Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, um, the uh, and it's, it's probably the same reason, actually, that Paul did not include the witnesses of the women in 1 Corinthians 15, is that in a court of law, um, the testimony of the woman uh, of, of women had no value, um, and so we're not saying that's right. That was just the way that it was in first century uh, Israel. So why would you make your first witnesses to the resurrection those that would not be have credibility even in a court of law? Um, then the third fact is the the post mortem appearances of Christ. So you then have over a period of forty days. 12 separate appearances of Jesus, um, sometimes to um, uh, the disciples, sometimes to an individual, some, uh, on one occasion to a group of over 500 people at one time. 
Um, this is, again, hugely significant because these aren't visions. You always have to distinguish a vision um, uh, or a dream uh, from an appearance because on several of these occasions, Jesus actually eats with the disciples. Um, uh, the, they're able to put their fingers into his hands and into his feet. So these are not visions. These are not hallucinations. These are appearances. And, uh, you know, even the hardened skeptic um, who perhaps doesn't want to believe in any of this um, has to recognize, and, and many non-Christian New Testament critics recognize, that these disciples truly believed they were having appearances of Christ. And then the fourth fact, um, <clears throat> which uh, is largely <clears throat> um, indisputable with New, New Testament critics, is the disciples' belief in the resurrection and their preaching of it in Jerusalem within seven weeks <clears throat> of the death of Jesus, and the birth and then incredible growth of the church, which has to be accounted for. Hugely significant again, because here you have a group of people who've just lost their leader. They believed he was the Messiah who was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. He's now dead. All their hopes have been totally shattered. They're in deep grief. They're terrified for their lives. They're in hiding or they're going back to their previous careers. Um, the Jews did not believe in uh, a, a, a resurrection of this nature. They believed, many of them believed, not all, but many of them believed in a general resurrection at the end of time. Remember when Jesus goes to the grave of Lazarus? And he's having a conversation with Lazarus' sister and so on. Uh, well, Lord, I, I know that he will be raised at the last day. So there was a belief in uh, the resurrection at the last day, but no belief that Lazarus would come out of the grave uh, there, and certainly no belief that Jesus would be raised from the dead. You've got these terrified disciples. Suddenly, something has happened to them that they are now preaching the resurrection in the very place where... Uh, the very city where Jesus had been crucified, where you've got both the Jewish and the Roman authorities knowing the location of the, of the tomb with every opportunity to produce the body to end the movement. They don't produce the body. The only uh, apologetic that was made up, as you met, referred to earlier, Nate, was that the, the early Jewish apologetic was that the disciples must have come and stolen the body while the guards slept. Um, which is not credible for a variety of reasons, you know, fishermen overcoming professional soldiers, guards all sleeping on duty. And if they were asleep, how did they know that the disciples stole the body? Um, so it, it, the, 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 the story um, doesn't add up, but that was the, what the guards were paid to say. And no alternative legend or story or counter narrative ever developed. So not only was the body of Jesus never produced or has ever been produced, but there was no counter narrative developed um, about the body of Jesus. So you've got those four facts. You've got the death and burial of Jesus. You've got the empty tomb of Jesus. You've got the post-mortem appearances of Jesus. And then you have the preaching of the early disciples and the growth of the church. Now that, I, interestingly, um, Nate, that um, evidence let's call them those data points, those, those facts, um, are not actually that controversial. You would expect them to be much more controversial than they are with modern New Testament critics, but they're not actually that controversial. Uh, and this is where we must note, and this is where presuppositional apolog apologetics comes in. You have to note the difference between the evidence and the explanation of the evidence. Right. Um, it's, you can look at all those four facts, but the, uh, those data points, but the question is what best accounts for the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances and the preaching and growth of, uh, uh, of the church. Yeah. And it's interesting. So, uh, um, and I think traditionally that's what a lot of debates, I know you've done a number of debates uh, throughout your life on the resurrection. And, uh, and this is likely even in your, with some of your history before founding the Institute with apologetics, these would have been some of the kinds of questions and apologetics that we would have talked about, right? We would have talked about the, the fact that the, uh, the first w uh, witnesses uh, were women and, and why would you write the story that way if you're making something up? And we would, we would have those kinds of conversations 
Um, but uh, I, I noted this when I was preaching on Sunday, as I said, you know, interestingly, one of the most interesting passages of scripture in the whole resurrection narrative for me in any of the gospel accounts is in, in Matthew 28, I think it's verse 17, where it says, you know, the disciples came to him on the mountain in Galilee. This is right before he gives the great commission and, and tells them that all authority has been given to him. And it says, yeah, they, th- that they came and they worshiped him, but some doubted. <laughs> and so that's right. And so you have, you know, this um, this group of, of people who Jesus was very publicly crucified, very publicly mocked, very publicly, you know, killed. The Romans were very proficient at making, um, you know, those who they executed public displays of Rome's power. And uh, and so this, this, you know, the fact that Jesus died, was on the cross— I mean, this wouldn't have been disputed, and yet some of those followers who came to the mountain of Galilee that Christ ascended from, it says some doubted. They saw him there. They saw him in his resurrection body, and yet some doubted. And so that reminds us that it's not evidence that turns the hearts of a people. And I think that there are many, you know, sort of skeptics or uh, today who would say, well, if only God would make himself obvious, if only he would reveal himself, if only this, if only that. But of course, we know, scripturally speaking, theologically speaking, that that's uh, complete rubbish, that Romans 1 tells us that they do know that they are accountable to God, and they suppress the truth that they know about God. And so there's no such thing as an atheist in that regard. So how then, if, if we know that those evidence isn't what's actually going to convince the world that Christ resurrected from the dead, I think... This is my perspective, and I, I think it's yours as well, Joe, so I'll let you go um, with it, is I think we as Christians honestly need to get back to the more cosmological arguments for the resurrection of Christ, right? So the very fact that you started that with, you know, Christ splits the calendar. We live in a world that has been fundamentally changed because a man rose from the dead, because the grave has been robbed, because Christ has overcome death, because death has now lost its sting. And, and a group of people who have put faith in Jesus, as Hebrews t- uh, 2 says, have been liberated from the fear of death that enslaved us previously. Because of those realities, we can trust in the resurrection. So I think we need to get back to that sort of, you know, uh, if you look at the way that the apostles preached the gospel throughout the book of Acts, it sort of was like, you know, God created the world. God appointed that the world be judged by one man who he raised from the dead, Christ is raised from the dead. He's the king of kings. Deal with it. That, that was sort of how they preached the gospel. I think we need to get back to that if we're we're talking uh, to a world now that uh, those sorts of evidence-based arguments are no longer working. Yeah, it's certainly the case that, that we have to... Um, it's certainly the case that it's, that it's still very much the truth that I think it was Cyril Jode, he was a famous English philosopher, who said... The most important question in the world is, did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? But uh, yeah, one of the things right. that I, I I said when I opened my discussion about this in my opening remarks um, was that I'm not talking about the resurrection today or defending the resurrection today because it is doubtful. I'm not, I'm not uh, offering evidences today because it's doubtful. Um, I'm talking about it because the resurrection is a sign it's a signpost and signposts get our attention and they point us in the right direction. Now, as you said, the New Testament puts forth the res- resurrection at, puts forth the resurrection as the sort of singular, the, the, the most singular proof of Christ's identity. Um, and you, but you don't prove the proof. I mean, if you proved the proof, it wouldn't be the proof anymore, would it? I mean, you'd be what you proved it with would be the proof. And I said to people, I said, look, you know, if I proved this to you today in some sort of deductive sense, then somehow then the Christian faith down the centuries and the claims of God on your lives depend on me and my argument, which is ludicrous. Um, uh, so, you know, we don't we don't prove the proof. God sets forth the proof. So what we do with the resurrection is we bear witness. And uh, one of the things I reminded, again, some of these young uh, students um, was that, look, the 2.4 billion people in the world today, 2,000 years later, believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, that 
that's a lot of people. That doesn't in of itself offer you a mathematical deductive proof of the resurrection, but it's significant testimony. And because Jesus is alive, this isn't merely some sort of historical question. In fact, it isn't actually a historical question primarily. It's um, it's a theological and existential question. It, it, it happened in history, um, but the, the existential reality that we're confronted with, and, and I myself as a believer, is that Christ is alive, therefore I can know him. He's not dead. I know the resurrected Lord. Um, and that's why the Lord Jesus said, you know, to Thomas, uh, when he was, you know, doubting Thomas there, and he said, unless I see his hands and his feet and I put my fingers into the marks, um, and uh, Jesus appears uh, with the disciples there, as you know, and he says, my Lord and my God. Uh, but Jesus then says, yeah, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And, you know, um, the, you know, it was... Thomas was right there and he and he wanted this, you know, the immediacy of all of this physical evidence. But Jesus yep, said, yes, but actually blessed are those who, will, who, who have not seen, but nonetheless believe. And that's all of us after the Apostle Paul, um, who were not uh, direct witnesses of the resurrected Lord, um, like the early, many of the early disciples and apostles. And it's significant. And I think you were referring to Acts 17 there in your uh, last comment uh, that God has given proof of this, Paul says to the Greek philosophers. Interestingly, he says it to the Greeks, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Um, God's given proof of this by raising him from the dead. Paul does then not go on. There's no evidence that he goes on then to give a detailed list of historical evidences to argue like a sort of evidential classical apologist uh, in terms of, you know, um, the 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 evidences for the empty tomb, um, the post mortem appearances. I mean, these are significant. I would say those kinds of arguments were were helpful in a Christianized culture, um, where people had familiarity with the New Testament text, uh, where people were much more literate about history and and biblical history in particular. Um, but as you say, increasingly now that literacy is gone. Um, but the resurrection remains a signpost. It's a sign. And signs get our attention. And they point us to the one who is uh, is alive. And that gives us an opportunity ourselves to bear witness to the truth of the resurrection. What I always try and do is when I, ever, when, when I talk about, let's say I refer to uh, Josephus, for example, or I refer to the ossuaries, the burial urns, of the uh, the the uh, the Christians in the early decades. So actually, we have we found burial urns referring to the resurrection within twenty years of Jesus' death. Now, you know, from an archaeological historical point of view, that's hugely significant because this shows you these are not legends. You know, you, legends build up over a long period of time, um, but the, 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 these are people are already being buried. Um, uh, with reference to the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a very, very short period of time. So, look, the issue is not about, gosh, there's a paucity of evidence. In fact, the, 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 you know, the New Testament text itself, um, which has been treated like no other ancient text with the highest degree of skepticism and cynicism, we don't treat any other ancient text uh, anything like that. So we have a well-established uh, New Testament text text we have these witnesses that's not the problem the the issue is unbelief and, and and you may be interested in this Nate one of the things I said when I opened up the debate apart from saying I'm not debating this because it's doubtful I am a Christian <laughs> and I and I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ rose from the dead but what I did say was that the resurrection of Jesus is not an isolated event it's not just like a fact over here that's of some passing historical interest. I said it, the, the resurrection of Christ only makes sense and is actually only coherent and even plausible in a world in which God exists and acts in history. I mean, if you don't have a living God who actually acts in history, 
you can talk about historical evidences till you're blue in the face for um, you know a post a, a resurrection of a corpse. But even if a corpse came back from the dead, that doesn't that wouldn't actually prove anything. Could be signed off for some kind of resuscitation, or um, maybe there was some uh, you know ancient technology like modern cryogenics we didn't know about, or you know this is an uncertain universe. It's an unpredictable universe. Uh, freak things do happen uh, that we can't fully account for. Any number of things could be said. No, the resurrection of Christ is important because it's part of a coherent world and life view. And the resurrection makes no more sense to the unbeliever who rejects God and his activity in history than having Bugs Bunny show up in a Marvel movie. It just, it it doesn't fit, right? Suddenly Bugs Bunny comes in and he's helping Iron Man. Uh, You know, it there's a there's a, there's a clash. The, the, the world views don't mesh, and this is the problem when we're talking about the resurrection. And this is where the the world view and the presuppositional element comes in. Is that you know, and actually Kierkegaard, probably the first true presuppositionalist, um, talked about this in the 19th century. Um, that uh, you know, you can't make the resurrection of Jesus Christ plausible. You can't make the incarnation of Jesus Christ plausible to an unbelieving heart. That's the very point of the gospel, is that it's implausible to those who reject God, who hold down the truth in unrighteousness. They will accept any explanation for the resurrection other than that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's why Paul said to Agrippa, why should it seem incredible to you, O king, that God should raise the dead because the claim of Easter is not that um, Jesus naturally rose from the dead, that the man came out of his grave. It is that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's the claim. And that is not plausible to the unbeliever who cannot receive the the things of the spirit of God. So what we do is we bear testimony. We bear witness through our arguments, through our testimony and the Holy Spirit uses that to get hold of people's hearts. That's the that's the goal of it. And I, I made very uh, clear that I had very modest expectations for what any given apologetic for um, a historical event um, can accomplish, because history is not directly as accessible to us, is it? I mean, um, I I, uh, I I I couldn't. I can't prove that Caesar crossed the Rubicon um, from, in a, from a historical point of view. I can't prove that Jerusalem fell in AD 70 um, in any sort of mathematical certitudinal sense because history is not directly accessible to us. I can't go back in time and witness Caesar crossing the Rubicon. I can't watch Titus surround Jerusalem um, and even then, you know, do I trust the testimony of my own eyes? I mean, you know, maybe I would have had a really bad piece of cheese that uh, that day, or the, the people viewing, you know, that Titus's siege of Jerusalem were all hallucinating. Do, do you see what I mean? Hi- history is 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 never something that you uh, um, establish with some kind of mathematical certitude. That's not how we establish historical events. So. That's why the evidences are signs. That's why the miracles of Jesus are signs. Uh, that's why the testimony of the scriptures is are signs to us. But God, uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit, must create in us at the same time the condition to receive the truth. The truth is there. God's born witness to it in history, through his son, through the scriptures, but he must also create the condition in our hearts to see and understand and receive the truth. And that's really, really important to to keep in mind, as you say, when we engage in these um, apologetic discussions, because there's worldview dependence. Our attitude towards God, our moral posture towards God, our, um, our spiritual ethos is going to shape what we receive as valid evidence or not. Yeah, that's right. I, I think one of the so is the 
you mentioned that um, obviously an unbelieving heart cannot accept the the facts of the resurrection, but it, the motivation there is that the implication of the reality of Christ's resurrection is that there is now a King of Kings and a Lord of Lords. And I think that that's one area where I think we would say that some of even our Christian brothers and sisters who reject the Lordship of Christ in all areas um, are, are sort of in, in, in some ways wrestling with the same um, ill motivations of heart. The reason I say that is because we both know that the resurrection has implications in the real world. It's not just that if you put faith in this, then when you die, you'll go to heaven. So it's mu- it's about much more than that. It's it's about you know Christ. He doesn't say until after the resurrection that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And I think you and I would both interpret Daniel chapter seven as the ascension of Christ coming into the throne room before the ancient of days, where he is given all authority. And so you know I I, I talked about this on Sunday at our church is that. You know, Christ has divine birthright, by divine birthright, the right to rule, right? He has the power and the right to make every knee bow and every tongue confess. He has the power to do that. But God the Father saw that it would be most fitting and most beautiful if the one who had the right to rule also purchased the right to rule by dying in our place. So he's he's both a the God man with divine rights and he also is the redeemer with purchased rights. And what what took place on the cross I think, you know, it, Psalm 2 is interesting because Psalm 2 there's there's a few verses in it that are quoted in the New Testament and of course whenever an Old Testament passage is quoted in the New Testament we're given you know, God's divinely inspired commentary on the Old Testament passage. And so in Psalm 2, we're talking, you know, why do the nations rage, the people's plot in vain, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Well, that's Psalm 2 verses 1 and 2, but it's quoted in Acts chapter 4 and the apostle Peter applies those verses to the crucifixion. And he says, surely gathered in, in your city were, you know, uh, lawless men who crucified Christ. And so that those verses are about the resurrection. And then verse seven, where it says, I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son today, I've begotten you. Well, Christ is eternal. He wasn't created being. So it's not about the creation of Christ. It's not even about the incarnation of Christ that today I have begotten you. What is that decree? Well, again, in, in Acts chapter 13, I think it's in verse three, that verse is quoted and applied to the resurrection of Christ. So that's about the resurrection. So if you have in in Psalm chapter 2, you have the crucifixion, and then you have the resurrection, and then you get to verse 10. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear. And and so you have the the real world implications of of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is that he is now king of kings and lord of lords. He now has the right to rule. All authority now belongs to him. And I think that this is where even some Christians get the implications of the resurrection wrong because they would deny that Christ has the right to rule over the public sphere, right? Over politics, over culture, over the academies, over everything. And this is really kind of gets to the heart of what Ezra is all about. So why don't you kind of uh, close off our discussion conversation on the resurrection by talking about that implication that Christ is King of Kings and and Lord of Lords because of the incarnation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really um, interesting few comments there, especially on Psalm 2. And I think the, the critical point that you make is that the, the real reason people won't accept the biblical explanation for the resurrection, even if they accept the data points, of the death of Jesus, right. an empty tomb, some people having post-mortem appearances, and their preaching, which they believed, and remember, they were ready to die. James, right. uh, the apostle James, remember, who was the brother of Jesus, who didn't himself believe until after the resurrection, um, yep. is martyred in AD 60, according to, to, to Josephus. He's, he's killed. Now, think about that for a moment. What would it take for any of us to believe that our brother, our brother yeah. is the Lord of glory, yeah. that he was raised right. from yeah. the dead and is the Lord of glory to be worshipped and served? 
to the point where not only do you become the leader of the church in Jerusalem, but you are prepared to be martyred for your faith in your brother. Now, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's an astonishing reality. Now, of course, um, just as Stephen, you know, after the resurrection, the first martyr, Stephen, what does he see? He's, he, he sees a vision, um, and he sees a vision of Christ at the place of all power and of all authority, and he uh, standing at the right hand of God uh, as, as Stephen is, is, is martyred for his witness and testimony to Christ's identity, his death and his resurrection, and Christ stands to, to receive him. And it was the implication of what Stephen was saying about Jesus that caused them to stick their fingers in their ears and rush at him to kill him. And of course, we know that, that Saul, later Paul, was there holding the coats. So, you know, it's absolutely true that when we're dealing with the resurrection, the reason people reject the explanation, even if they accept the, some of the bare historical data points, is the implications of the resurrection. What does it mean for me? How does this challenge me? How does this mean I have to change my life? What does this mean I have to acknowledge about myself? What, what, what does this mean for the way I live the rest of my days? How I interact with other people? Um, how I live um, with my um, uh, fellow citizens, my own family? How I conduct myself sexually? All of these things are tied up in the explanation uh, that you will receive for the resurrection, that you will accept, because it's the implications of the resurrection that are so startling. And that's why in the illustration that you gave in Acts 17, uh, in that great uh, um, uh, apology, uh, that great apologetic that Paul gave at the Areopagus, as you had three reactions, didn't you, when he talked about the resurrection? And then he said, don't forget, he didn't finish with the resurrection, but he has set a day when he's going to judge the world in righteousness. And the proof that he's, the, the, the point that Paul was making, that, and that he was using the resurrection to establish, was that God is judge. And that he's going to judge the world in righteousness. And he's given proof of this to everyone by raising a man from the dead. Now, that's the implication that we don't like, that God is a righteous judge. And that he's holding us all accountable. The meaning of life is accountability. We live coram Deo before the face of God. The meaning of life is accountability. Um, that, so that's the first implication Paul hits on it, and so some scoff. Some said at the Areopagus, well, we'd like to hear you again about this. We're kind of interested in what you've got to say, and a few prominent members believed. So the first, the first implication is that accountability. The second implication that you've, I think, exegeted really well there in a short space of time, that, as you say, is in a sense related to the unbelievers' Uh, concern about the implications of the resurrection by way of repentance and accountability and faith um, extends to the believer who is concerned about the implications of the resurrection for culture, concerned about the, 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 the implications of the resurrection uh, for who Christ is uh, in the immediacy of human history. Christ was not raised merely spiritually. Uh, you know, if Christ had been raised merely spiritually as like a ghost, as a disembodied being and had just gone up to heaven, then we could all say, well, Jesus is a spiritual savior of my soul. And uh, one day I'm going to go to heaven because I believe that God received his sacrifice and took him up. No, that he ate breakfast. Um, now, he did say, of course, the Last Supper, he said, you know, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine with you again until I drink it anew in my father's kingdom. But he ate fish with his disciples by the sea. Uh, he broke bread at Emmaus. Um, he, th this is a physical, resurrected Lord who is the firstborn from the dead. Um, and this establishes his lordship. And as you said, he went up then on to eventually to the mountain of Ascension after the 40 days of appearances. And he told the disciples, all authority in heaven and earth is his. And then we have another doctrine 
and it's the one that Stephen testifies to, the ascension becomes the session of the Lord Jesus Christ, which Psalm 2 talks about, where he is then, he enters into the heavenlies as a man, as a human being, and is seated today as a human being at the right hand of all power and all authority. And um, he says to us, occupy till I come, disciple the nation, um, bring them, disciple them, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. All authority belongs to me. Um, so, uh, Revelation 1.5, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. That resurrected Lord then has something to say, not just about the final judgment, but about everything that's taking place in history right now. Um, you know, his words about the destruction of the temple, remember, um, Christ fulfilled them in AD 70. Not one stone will be left on another. Your house is left to you desolate. Titus surrounds uh, Jerusalem in AD 70, I referred to it, and plows up the very foundation stones of the temple. This has real world historical kingdom implications now for prime ministers, for kings, for presidents, for judges, for magistrates, for politicians, for butchers, for bakers, for candlestick makers. And this resurrected Lord says that I am ruling and reigning now. And eventually every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One of the great hymns of the early church of the, of the, uh, of the, of the very first disciples, that great tradition that they sang about Christ's self-humbling, his self-humiliation. Um, and then, um, but God then having exalted him to the highest place and given him past tense, past tense, given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. We do that willingly or we do it unwillingly. And I think you're right that, Failure to recognize Anno Domini. This is the year of our Lord. He has shattered history into two halves. He declares his lordship and his kingship now, and the implications are for every single area of life. There are many Christians even who accept the data that Christ is raised, they accept the data, the historical data that he's ascended and that he's at the right hand of God, but they're not sure about the full explanation. They're not sure that they want to accept that he is ruling and reigning now in history and he's bringing all things into subjection, that he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be defeated is death. Amen. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the that's the world changing reality of the Easter weekend. And so coming out of the Easter weekend, we wanted to take some time to talk about this because um, really this is foundational for all that Ezra does as we uh, preach prophetically into the public sphere and we tell um, doctors to live and think Christianly in the wake of the resurrection of Christ and lawyers and politicians and and educators and everybody is that uh, the risen Christ has something to say about how you live within the sphere that he's placed you. And uh, and if you, uh, if you want to check out more of that, you can uh, go to EzraPress.com and you can uh, get Ruler of Kings. Joe has uh, written a whole book on this topic and, uh, and you can uh, get that there. But uh, we'll wrap up our, our Easter uh, Resurrection podcast there. Uh, we have some exciting things coming down. Uh, we talked a little bit about presuppositional apologetics in this episode and how it applies to the resurrection and some of the traditional evidential-based apologetics um, surrounding the resurrection. And that's a bit of a little teaser about uh, maybe an upcoming series that we're going to be doing, talking about how to engage, how to think presuppositionally when it comes to objections to the Christian faith in your own personal witness and your own defense of the faith. So make sure you continue to check us out and uh and keep tuning in because uh, we have a lot more to say on that subject so until next time we want to remind you that from him and through him and to him are all things we'll see you again next week